Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are we? Whoa, I've got multiple videos on the go here. What's going on? Is the echo stopped? Is the echo stopped? No, there you go. <laughs> no. <laughs> Is that better? Nah, I can't hear anything. There we go. How are we, folks? I just thought we'd have a little drop in. We're um we're on a kind of not a week off, but, you know, we built these 20 live classes throughout the year to make sure that you guys have uh, covered everything that you can, that you should by the end of March. But you know what? On these kind of down times, we're, um, you know, we just want to pop in and say hello and, and see how the whole YouTube community is doing and uh, just check in with you guys and, and basically just offer some help. So, you know, that's what I'm here uh, doing. Uh, nice to see you people. We got Luca, we got Raseb, uh, we got Ruhab, we got uh, Rama, we got T-Boy. Um, so no, I mean, we're on a like a down week this week. Um, so we've built three or four of those in between now and March. Um, just because, you know, I mean, it's, it's, we don't want to be too intense. Okay. But we've, we've tailored these 20 lessons to cover the entire specification. Okay. Between year one and year two. So that's what we're doing. So Harvey would have been able to help me with reduction of nitrobenzene to form an amine. Um, we'll see how we get on. I'm on here for an hour. Um, we've already had some people give me some requests. You know, this has been up for a good few days. Okay. So this has been up for a few days, basically. And I've asked people right in the comment down here and on, I pinned it as the, in the description to let me know what to cover. And you know what? It is kind of a first come first, sir, uh, first, uh, first come first served kind of thing. So um, maize finding A2 chemi organic difficult. Any tips? Yeah, use my organic cheat sheet. Okay, that's my tip for organic chemistry year two. Um, yeah, carboxylic acids in there can be tough. There's a few extra links in there which weren't there for year one, of course. Um, you know, you need to look at their derivatives like esters and amides and um, acyl chloride. Some of you need to do... Um, Oh, what are they called? Um, names escaping me. Uh, <laughs> not acyl chlorides, uh, acid anhydrides. That's the one. That's the one. So um, I promised I'd go over KC first of all, because that's a year one topic. I think it's more and more appropriate to start with some year one stuff. So I just want to look through some of the um, fundamental things in terms of KC, okay, just to make sure you have a good kind of understanding of what's going on in there with KC and of course KP as well. So I'm just going to click over to uh, my iPad and we'll have a little look. Um, so KC. Now KC is essentially a ratio, okay? So we'll do KC up here like so. Um, it's essentially a ratio okay now the equation itself or the expression itself isn't the most difficult thing to learn okay so let's say uh we've got i don't know let's do the old classic um haber process okay to nh3 so of course what we've got here kc we can use concentrations these are all gases of course um these are square brackets okay now it's basically the concentration of products over the concentration of reactants okay like uh like this but the thing is what's missing there ladies and gentlemen very very quickly what's missing there from that expression what do i need to do in order to fix that and make it work as an expression for kc yeah absolutely we have the powers so anything here in terms of your balancing of your equation, NH3 needs to be two to the power of two. And of course the hydrogen needs to be to the power of three. So what we're looking at here, the constant relative, well, not relative, the actual concentrations of these. Um, what I wanna point out to you with the fact that it's a ratio, it's a balance between the concentration of products and the concentration of the reactants, okay? Now, if I said this equilibrium lay to the right, 
Okay, so naturally, when an equilibrium is reached, it's naturally lying to the right. And that's fine. We've talked about, okay, it shifts to the right, it shifts to the left. But what does that mean numerically for the value of KC? If it lies to the right towards the products, what does that mean numerically for the value of KC, folks? Broadly speaking, generally speaking. Any ideas? Raseb saying smaller, May saying lower. Large, more than one. Prize goes to Harvey. I tip my cap to you, okay? It's larger. If it shifts into the right, this concentration here is going to be greater than these concentrations over here. Now, if this numerator here is big number and the ones at the bottom are small number, KC equals greater than one if it shifted to the right. Okay, so if you see a KC value that's above one, that means your equilibrium lies to the right. If KC is less than one, which it usually is, that means it's shifted to the left. It means your concentration of products is overall greater than your concentration, uh, sorry, your, your concentration of reactants is overall greater than your overall concentrations of products, okay? So I want you to just have that in your mind. Whenever you see a KC value, and usually they're pretty small, like 10 to the power or something, um, 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four, usually they're very small. So most of the time you do see these equilibria lying to the left and you do get questions. So, um, you know, if uh, the temperature was increased and shifted to the right, what happens to the value of KC? Okay, they like asking that question. So if this is, um, this has got a value of minus 92 kilojoules per mole, okay, that's the delta H for that forward reaction there. What would happen to the value of KC if I increase the temperature? What would happen to the value of KC if I increase the temperature for this particular reaction? Would it increase or would it decrease? Yeah, brilliant. Okay, first three have it. It will decrease because it's shifting to the left. KC is going to get smaller. And of course, it really depends on the equilibrium, doesn't it? Because it depends on the delta H of the equilibrium, which way it shifts when you Im impact that temperature change. So you've got to have this general understanding of what happens to the value of KC when you increase or decrease temperature to shift it left and right. What would happen to the value of KC in this equation here? And I'll get rid of all the kind of gubbins around it so you can see, the, see it more clearly. What would happen to the value of KC here if I was to increase the pressure, ladies and gentlemen? Any takers, if I increase the pressure, that favors the side with the fewest moles of gas if you increase the pressure. Okay, so what's happening to the value of KC there? No one, ladies and gentlemen, has given me the correct answer. What is the correct answer? Some people are saying decrease. Some people are saying increase. If no one's given me the right answer, what is the right answer? You keep saying increase and decrease. <laughs> Boom. That's it. It stays the same because the only thing that can affect the value of KC or KP for those of you in the second year is temperature. You can change the concentrations. You can change the pressures all you want. You can even add a catalyst if you want to. They will not, I repeat, not ever in a million years change the value of the equilibrium constant Kc or Kp. The only change in conditions that changes the value of Kc or Kp is a change in temperature. So mental note on that one, okay? Because I've seen exam questions ask the same thing that I have just asked, you know? What happens to the value of KC if the pressure is increased? The answer is nothing, okay? So KP is exactly the same, okay? It works in exactly the same way. The only difference is you're dealing with partial pressures, okay? And working out those partial pressures is probably the most difficult part of that. But once you have your partial pressures, you throw them into this equation in exactly the same way. 
If it's above one, that means it lies to the right-hand side. If it's below one, it lies to the left-hand side. And so all these principles for KC and KP are exactly the same, exactly the same. Okay, so I cannot stress that enough. So that over overarching principle, okay, remember it's a ratio. You've got one and it lies directly in the middle at equilibrium. Above one, it lies towards the products. Below one, it lies towards the reactants, okay? Um, we're not going to do transition metals tonight, Jazz. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have time to it. Uh, Rasso, could we go through equilibrium moles? So deducing numbers of moles at equilibrium, there's a few different methods of teaching. I've got a few other things on my sleeve, Jazz, that we are going to be covered that I promise will, will, will be helpful, okay? So in terms of numbers of moles at equilibrium, let's have a look at that. So I'll tell you what, let's just stick to this one, okay? Uh, this uh, equation. So N2 plus 3H2 goes to... 2NH3. So you get a question, they say, okay, a student set up an equilibrium, and in that equilibrium, um, they set up uh, numbers of moles. Okay, and let's say we're dealing with, um, you know, just numbers of moles here. Let's say you put um, three moles of nitrogen into the equilibrium, and you put uh, 10 moles of hydrogen uh what and they'll give you one other thing okay so what they'll do is they'll give you maybe um in this two things two numbers of moles uh, that are put into the equilibrium mixture but then it says then it's left to reach equilibrium and then they give you one bit of data okay one bit of data at equilibrium. So let's say at equilibrium, um the number of moles of NH3 was uh I don't know four. OK. So what I do to work out numbers of moles at equilibrium is I write this. So initial. This is our initial numbers of moles that go into the reaction. Three moles of nitrogen, 10 moles of hydrogen. So I always set it out like this when I answer my question here. Nothing because there's no ammonia when you first introduce the reactants together. There's no ammonia there at all. Sometimes there might be, okay? It depends on what the question is, but most of the time there isn't. What we need to do is find the numbers of moles at equilibrium in order to calculate our KC value, okay? So this is about stoichiometry, okay? It's all about stoichiometry. So the first thing, first things first, okay? We know we have made four moles of ammonia. OK, so let's look at the stoichiometry between these two things. So between nitrogen and ammonia, it's a one to two. If we have made four moles of ammonia, how many moles of nitrogen got used to make that ammonia? If we got four moles of ammonia. How many moles of nitrogen got used is what I'm asking. You need to think about in terms of what was used. Rama, absolutely, two, because it's a one to two ratio. We made four moles, therefore we must have put two moles in. So I put a little minus two there, like that. So two of those three moles were used, okay? So that leaves us with how much nitrogen at equilibrium. I think Ruhab already got it. One. OK, so two was used. Think about what was used of your reactants and just take that away. OK, so same principle here. Two mole, uh, four moles of ammonia was produced from three moles of hydrogen. Now, you've got a three to two ratio here. OK, and we can do it using the same method as we just did for nitrogen. But you know what? Those of you that know me know I don't like to faff around with maths too much, okay? I like the easiest route possible. Now we know how many moles of nitrogen got used in the reaction. We also know this bit here, if I highlight it, in fact, there, how many moles of hydrogen got used in the reaction if we used two moles of nitrogen? How many moles of hydrogen got used? Three, absolutely, okay? No, it's not three. No, that's a big fat lie. It's a one to three ratio, but it's six, okay? The reason we used two moles of nitrogen in the reaction, we know that, we worked it out. And this is a one to three ratio. So here we must have used six moles. 
So how many moles of hydrogen are left over? Yeah, so that's four moles of hydrogen are left over, okay? So essentially, you could have worked it out in the same way as we worked out nitrogen, all from this over here. But now you've got nitrogen, you don't have to, okay? You know how many moles of nitrogen we used, so then you use that to find the stoichiometry of your hydrogen, okay? So that's what we're doing there, okay? And that's how we find our numbers of moles at equilibrium. Of course, you shouldn't really use numbers of moles if we're calculating Kc, okay? But you need to turn it into a concentration, ideally. Um, but of course, if we're using Kp, then you've got your numbers of moles and you've got information about pressures and you convert it into partial pressures. Okay. I'm not going to go down that road now because we never, we didn't say we were going to talk about Kp too much tonight. So Raseb, if you don't get it, I recommend you look back at it. I go over this method in the course as well. Okay. So yeah, concentration equals uh, numbers of moles di uh, divided by volume. Absolutely. So if you're given the volume of the entire flask or the, or the total volume of liquid, for example, you can work out those concentrations very, very easily. Okay. Now there is a situation whereby... Uh, you don't have to turn the number of moles you've got into a concentration. And that's when you don't have any units for Kc, when Kc units cancel out and there's no units for the um, equilibrium constant. But not everybody needs to do units for that. So don't worry too much. OK, I'm pretty sure it crops up more often than not in Edexcel, the units thing. So those of you doing Edexcel probably need to worry about that a little bit more. But it's all covered in the course. It's all covered in the content guide. And of course, all the questions that you needed to do in the new spec uh, exam guide, okay? So that's that one, that's KC, okay? Now, in terms of uh, what else we're gonna cover, because we know we're doing a bit of a whistle-stop tour tonight, guys. Um, so we mentioned HNMR. I think we'll, we'll look at that next, okay? After acids and bases. So how, we, how do we feel about the working with acids and bases, ladies and gents? Yeah, it can be tough. Absolutely, it can be tough. Okay, if you haven't done it, okay. <laughs> you don't like it, don't like it. That's fine. Mm. Yeah, it's an A2 topic. I mean, OCR, touch on acids and bases and calculating pH, I think. Do you calculate pH in year one? And you touch on acids and bases, OCR peeps in, um, in year one. Um, but acids and bases is, um, I mean, you've been dealing with them a lot in year one anyway, because you're doing lots of titrations. So many titrations, all right? You just spend your life doing titrations in year, in year one. Um, okay, so... A few people have done acids and bases. I mean, what about HNMR? It is something I've done previously uh, and helped people out with in the um, in the starting year 13 uh, revision kit. So if you haven't covered it yet, well, I'll tell you what, let me give you a whistle-stop tour of what to expect for uh, acids and bases, okay? You're not done HNMR yet either. Okay, it's, it's difficult when everyone's doing so many different things, isn't it? And this is just a drop-in session. So acids and bases. So um, the pH scale, okay, is obviously we know what the pH scale is, okay, between zero and, and 6.9 recurring basically is acidic, and then obviously above uh, seven, that's going to be alkali. Um, but what's it actually a measure of? Do we know what the pH scale is actually measuring, ladies and gentlemen? And you know what? That would be a nice thing to go to, Raseb, wouldn't it? Yeah. So what would it actually be of? a measurement of hydrogen ions. Absolutely. That's what the H and pH stands for at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about hydrogen ion concentration, okay? So whenever you get a question um, on acids and bases, whenever you get a question calculating pH, if the question says calculate pH, all you have to do, you have to put all your effort into finding the hydrogen ion concentration because once you've got that, you can find the pH, okay? Because that's what pH is all about. It's all about hydrogen ion concentration. And if somebody asked you to define pH, okay? The definition of pH, 
easiest definition you'll learn in your in your two years doing AS, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the definition for pH is this: pH equals the minus log. You can put the base ten in if you want. You don't have to of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, that is your definition of pH. Right, so it's not a wordy definition like some of the ones we've come across before. It's literally just the equation. That is the only thing you can ever write for the definition of pH. And that's exactly how we calculate it. It's the uh, inverse log minus log uh, of the hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, now to get to this hydrogen ion concentration, because like I said, if you've been asked to calculate pH, all your efforts need to go into finding hydrogen ion concentration. If you've got a strong acid, it's nice and easy, okay? Because what do we know about strong acids, ladies and gentlemen? What's, what's the definition of a strong acid? Anybody got that for me? Because, all, of course, all acids, they release hydrogen ions, okay? When you think about HCl, H2SO4, H3PNO4, HNO3, yeah, boom, absolutely. They fully dissociate, okay? So these are nice and easy. Now, what I mean by fully dissociate is this. HCl, I'll tell you what, I'll give you some examples. HCl, H2SO4, HNO3, okay? These are nailed on strong acids. So when I say fully dissociate, if you take solid HCl and you dissolve it in water, or it's not solid HCl, gaseous HCl, so hydrogen chloride gas, and you dissolve it, every single molecule of HCl splits into hydrogen ions and chloride ions, okay? So every single one. So that's what I mean by fully dissociates. Um, the only ones you've got to watch out for, HNO3 does exactly the same thing. H2SO4 is known as diprotic. So what you end up with is two uh, hydrogen ions and your SO4, two minus aqueous, okay? So you've got to be careful of those. So when they dissociate, if you have a 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed solution of HCl, what's the hydrogen ion concentration, ladies and gentlemen? Anybody? So if you've got a 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed concentration of hydrochloric acid, you don't need a calculator root app. What's the concentration of hydrogen ions? Absolutely, equals 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed. You know this because every single molecule of HCl dissociates into those two things, okay? So it's exactly the same. If you had a 0.1 mole concentration of H2SO4, this one here, what's the hydrogen ion concentration? Boom, 0.2 because it's diprotic. It releases, two, every single molecule releases two hydrogen ions. So, you, you know, the concentration of the acid, okay, is gonna be, well, the concentration of hydrogen ions is double the concentration of the acid. So those are the only tricky ones to look out for. So finding the pH of a strong acid, well, if you know the concentration of that strong acid, you know the hydrogen ion concentration. It's really, really easy to work that out, okay? Now, last thing I'm going to say on acids and bases, and I don't, well, maybe we'll get to bases, okay? But weak acids. Now, weak acids are acids that do not fully dissociate, okay? So, e.g., classic this carboxylic acids, okay? They do not fully dissociate. Absolutely, thank you, Rasa. So we have got CH3, C-double-O-H. And when you put that in solution, you get CH3, C-double-O, uh, minus, and you get H plus. So they do dissociate. But the thing is, we can't put an arrow in like this because not every single molecule dissociates. What we have to do is this. So what gets set up when you put a weak acid in solution? What's being set up?
Any takers? Look at that symbol I've just drawn. An equ jar. Yeah, an equilibrium. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. An equilibrium. So that's what's being set up. So a weak acid sets up an equilibrium in solution. So you don't have every single molecule of it splitting up into the hydrogen ion and the what's known as the conjugate base. OK, but the negative ion, essentially. So we don't have that. So if I have a 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cube solution of ethanoic acid. If you have a 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed solution of ethanoic acid, we have no way of knowing what the hydrogen ion concentration is because it's not like strong acids. We can rely on strong acids to give up every single hydrogen ion they've got. But these, it's an equilibrium, okay? If only we had a method of actually getting a value. No, it's not half. No, it definitely is not half. Okay, we cannot make that assumption. But because it's set up in equilibrium, and this time, I'm so pleased with this. Hopefully you guys will be as well. If only there was a way of finding out how many have actually dissociated. If only we had an expression we could use to find out how much of our equilibrium lies to the right or lies to the left. I mean, can anybody think of an expression that we can use to find out where an equilibrium lies? Any ideas? Ruhab's a little bit ahead of the game here. Yeah, Harvey, this, boom, that right there, okay? Because KC is a ratio. The value of Kc actually tells us where our equilibrium constant lies, okay? Where does our equilibrium lie? And it gives us an actual um, kind of balance, if you like, okay? Ah, now, I'm going to write this out again. Now, Kc... OK, if we wanted to find the KC for this equilibrium, because it's a weak acid, we don't know how many, you know, exist in, in, in solution. We could take our products. So we need the concentration of that. And we need the concentration of that all over the concentration of that. Right. That's how we write our value, uh, write our expression for KC. OK. <laughs> So essentially what we're saying is that with a weak acid, because it doesn't fully dissociate, because it sets up an equilibrium, when you put that acid in solution, only some of them dissociate, some of them remain as, you know, the full weak acid, the associated version. We can set up an equilibrium expression for KC. Now, because weak acids are so common and because we work with weak acids so much, we don't call it KC, we call it KA. And why do we call it KA? Well, the A stands for acid, okay? So KA is KC by another name, okay? So in other words, AKA, KC. So KA is KC, okay? It's just given a slightly different name because we're dealing with acids. That's all it is, okay? So essentially, how does that help? All right. If we want the pH, we want the hydrogen ion concentration, don't we? OK, well, I'll tell you what. Let's say I had a 0 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed solution of um, ethanoic acid. OK, ethanoic acid. Now, if I wanted um, to calculate the Ka, all right, I would need to know two things, okay? I'd need to know the concentration of the acid, but I would also need to use or find the concentration of one of these two things, okay? Let's say this is one times 10 to the uh, minus six, for example. Let's say that's the concentration of hydrogen ions. I'm just giving you that information. It's not a fact. I've just made that number up, 
okay? So if I wanted the Ka value, that would be the concentration of our hydrogen ions, which is one times 10 to the minus six, um, over the concentration of our acid here, which is 0 0.1. So we've got that, we've got that. What about this, ladies and gentlemen? If I told you right now, you had everything you need to find the concentration of that CH3 C double O minus, what is that number? What is the concentration of the CH3 C double O minus, ladies and gentlemen? You don't need to calculate it for it. Can anybody figure out what that concentration might be? Not quite. We can we do mess with that, Ruhab, but it's not an answer I'm looking for. What is the concentration? The answer is on the page, but what is the concentration of CH3 C double O minus? Oh, it's a 50-50. You picked the wrong number. It is one times 10 to the minus six. Okay, that's it. Okay, one times 10 to the minus six. Because what's going on here? Well, if I took one of these, literally one molecule of ch 3 c oh okay, and it dissociated, you make one ch 3 c minus, and you make one hydrogen ion, okay? You cannot make one without the other, okay? Hi, Nee. You cannot make one without the other, okay? So these are always equivalent when you're talking weak acids, okay? So they're always equivalent. If you know one, you know the other. So this helps us, okay? How does it help us find pH? Well, it's through a rearrangement, okay? Let's say you were given, um, I tell you what, let's go over the page. Let's say you were given uh, the Ka value, okay? And you have the concentration of weak acid and it asks you to calculate pH. How'd you do it? Well, you know that Ka equals, well, let's, let's go with ethanoic acid because we've just been doing that. And hydrogen ion over the concentration of acid. We need to rearrange it because if we want pH, what did I say we always need to try and get a value for? If we want the pH, forget pH. We really want the value of what, ladies and gentlemen? What's it all about? Boom, H plus, absolutely, okay? So we need to rearrange it, don't we? Okay, we need to rearrange it. The thing is, we've got the Ka value and we've got that value there. But, and we want H plus, so what can we do about this value here? Any ideas how we can account for that? And I think somebody touched on it before. Somebody touched on it before. I can't remember who it was. Ruhab mentioned squaring something. So what we can do, we know that these two equal each other, don't we? And we just want the hydrogen ion concentration. Now, what we can do to get that hydrogen ion concentration is this. We can just do that because we know that the hydrogen ion concentration and the anion concentration are exactly the same, exactly the same. So we're just gonna lump them together to make it easier for the rearrangement, okay? So what we've got now is Ka, our weak our dissociation constant for an acid, okay, our equilibrium constant for our acid is hydrogen ion concentration squared divided by the concentration of the um, of the acid. So phaser, they're exactly the same because we were just saying that if you take one molecule of that and it splits up, you have to make one of those and one of those. So every time we make one, you make the other. You can't have one without the other. So that's why they're exactly the same. If you make 10 million hydrogen ions, you're making 10 million CH3 C double O minus. You with me? So we can assume they're exactly the same. So equal, yeah, 
Exactly. Equal numbers of moles, therefore, you know, in the same volume, they're going to be the same concentration. So if we've got this as our expression now, we can rearrange it. So the hydrogen ion concentration squared equals Ka times the CH3 C0OH. Okay, so I've just rearranged those two things to find H plus squared, okay? And you've got these two values, they're highlighted in yellow. So you find your value for H plus squared, then you square root it, okay, to find your hydrogen ion concentration. And then how do we find pH? What's our definition of pH again, ladies and gentlemen? If you can be bothered typing it in for me, that would be great. What's our uh, hydrogen ion concentration? Uh, what's our um, minus log? Yeah, minus log of the hydrogen ion concentration, you find the pH. So it's really quite, it's more long-winded doing it for weak acids. Strong acids walk in the park, okay? You just have to notice whether they're mo um, monoprotic or diprotic or monobasic or dibasic, whatever you want to say, okay? And you just find the concentration and plug it into minus log, okay? But with weak acids, it's you're going to get more marks for it because there's a lot more process to it and you have to use Ka, okay? Kw is absolutely related, okay? So if Ka is the acid, is the, uh, acid dissociation constant, what's the W stand for, Harvey? Yeah, it's with water. Absolutely, yes, yeah, with water. You don't need to know about weak bases phaser, okay? That's Kb not covered in any specification. You don't need to touch it with a barge pole. So if you see any questions involving weak bases uh, and equilibrium constants and things, stay away from it, okay? So yeah, KW, we need that to help us calculate um, the, the pH of strong bases, okay? What you guys need to know is to be able to calculate the pH for strong acids, weak acids, and strong bases. That's all you need to do. And in order to do strong bases, you need KW, but I'm not going to go into that now. Okay. I'm not going to go into that now. Um, if you've seen it in your textbook, I mean, we need to be aware of weak bases and the fact that they uh, do the same as weak acids, they set up equilibria. And I think that's really in the context of buffers, to be honest with you. Okay. But 100%, you will never be asked to calculate the pH for a weak base. I guarantee you, okay? Guarantee you'll never be asked to do that, okay? So in terms of calculating pH, those are the three things you need to be able to do. So compartmentalize them, know how to do it for each one, and you're laughing, okay? And there's a few other things that come in and around pH, like pH curves. Uh, you need to look at um, buffers as well, which causes many a student a headache every year. Um, but don't worry, we got you covered. I got you covered, uh, and we'll we'll make sure we go over it um, this year. And of course, no doubt, we'll be revising that come uh, revision time after March as well. So um, we've had a number of people in here asking me about carboxylic acids and ketones. Okay, so what is it you want to know? about carboxylic acids and ketones. I promised we'd look at um, carbonyls as well and the tests for carbonyls. Esters, all right, we'll see how much we get through in 20 minutes, okay? Okay, I'll tell you what, let's start with the reactions of carboxylic acids, okay? We are having, like I said, a bit of a whistle stop tour. We're all over the place here, and you're certainly putting me through my paces, that's for sure. So carboxylic acids are weak acids. We know this, okay? They're also organic acids. Um, and where they sit in our, um, uh, how can I put it? In our mind map, in our um, kind of, organic cheat sheet. In fact, what I'll do, guys, I'm going to stop sharing a second. I want to show you something very, very quickly, um, is this. Da, 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 da. Bear with, bear with, bear with. Um, tutorial plans...
I'm going to do AQA just because. And I need to share again. Okay, this, ladies and gentlemen, is what I like to call my organic cheat sheet. All right, this is, can be found in the course. All right, this is the AQA version. This is everything you need to know from AS to um, to A2. Oh, you rehab, don't be cheeky. I was bending down then. You can probably see how much I haven't got at the back. <laughs> um, so, what was I saying? Yes, so this is the AQA version. This is everything you need to know in terms of uh, linking all of your organic molecules together, aliphatic, so straight chain molecules, no benzene in this. Um, but what we look at, of course, is our carboxylic acid. Now, this is the AQA version. It's slightly different, of course, for every exam board. Um, but carboxylic acids, we should know, obviously, oxidation from alcohols. We should know that primary uh, alcohols give us carboxylic acids on oxidation. Um, acid anhydrides, hydrolysis produces carboxylic acids um, we can make esters with them okay um, we can also get to carboxylic acids from aldehydes we can get to them from esters we can get to them from acyl chlorides we can get to them from amides as well okay so loads of stuff going on carboxylic acids sit in this group of mainly oxygen containing species okay well all oxygen containing species so lots of routes to a carboxylic acid very um very few routes out of a carboxylic acid you'll notice okay so really in terms of carboxylic acids we only really look at producing esters so this is a great tool um to help you guys learn the links between all the organic species. There is an AS version as well. Um, in fact, I will show you that one other thing very quickly. Um, this is the blank version. So you can download the blank version from within the course. You can uh, practice, you know, writing the tests in, writing the reagents, writing the reactions, the names of the reactions and stuff like that. So, you know, it helps you practice learning your transitions between one uh, functional group and another. But anyway, carboxylic acids. How do we make esters? That is the question I think is on uh, on the lips of people that have come tonight. Um, so esters are, they're a joining of two functional groups. Okay, esters. So we can take CH3, CWOH, and react it with, I don't know, CH3, CH2OH, and make an ester. So CH3, uh, C double O, CH2, CH3. Okay, so that would be an ester, ladies and gentlemen. What you're looking for as an ester is this Ku. Okay, Ku is basically where we find the ester in the middle of a molecule. So what we're taking here is, and I want to give you a visualization because I think visualization is really, really important. So we take this CH3, I'm not going to draw all the hydrogens. C double OH, and we react it with the COH on the alcohol, and we make our ester. Now, what is the byproduct when we make an ester in this way? Any takers? What's the byproduct? I didn't write it up here. H2O. Absolutely. Where does that H2O come from? Well, that H2O comes from here. So what we're doing is we've got like bond fission, if you like, breaking there and breaking there. And we get H2O, which is why it's known as a condensation reaction. You know, those of you who are biologists probably recognize condensation. Thank you, Harvey. Absolutely. Taking the words out of my mouth there. Um, you'll notice you get them where? Where do you get those in biology? Rich will be proud of me talking about biology right at this point. Where would you find those in biology, biologists? Oh, a bit of, bit of year one stuff, biological molecules. Fats. 
not carbohydrates, but fats. You get ester bonds in fat. So where the, you, when you make triglycerides, where you get your fatty acid, <clears throat> your fatty acid reacting with your glycerol, your alcohol, yeah? So it's an alcohol and a carboxylic acid. So that's how you're, uh, you're creating. I know, I'm sorry, Ruha. Uh, that's where you're creating those um, ester bonds, okay? So esters forming that way. But what does the ester look like after the waters come out? Well, here and here, they join, okay? So what we end up with is our CH3, C double bond O, CO, CH2, Come on, undo, thank you, CH3. So that would be your ester and, of course, your H2O. So what you're looking for in terms of an ester functional group is this, right in the middle of a molecule, okay? That's C double bond O to CO. I mean, essentially, it's, it looks like a carboxylic acid, doesn't it? But it's just in the middle of a molecule. It's the joining together of an acid and an alcohol. So naming, ladies and gentlemen, how are we at naming? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down for naming esters. How good are we? Thumbs up for good, thumbs down for not so good. Down, down. Thumbs in the middle, kind of like that. Okay, like Caesar, like mm. Okay, so no thumbs up. So this is the way we do it. A carboxylic acid always has, oops, excuse me, itchy nose. That is your standard setup for naming an ester. Okay, boom, Harvey, straight in there. Now, how do we know this is ethyl ethanoate? Well, I'm going to use red pen for this. No, let's go orange. Let's go crazy. This section, we have got two carbon chains separate from each other, separated by that ester bond. Okay. So this is ethyl. Oh, because I've written it twice. Ethyl, because there's two carbons. Ethanoate. Ethyl ethanoate is the name of that ester. Now, I want to point something out to you. These two are the same. So that's nice and easy, ethyl ethanoate. It could be taking the two carbons from one side or the other, but it is important where you get. Yeah, don't worry, Kashmir, we'll do that, I promise, okay? Straight after this. So ethyl ethanoate, okay, is the name of this one. But the aisle bit, okay, this is the alcohol section, or what was the alcohol OK, uh, and I'm going to highlight that there. This bit here was our alcohol. This is the ethyl bit or the aisle bit. If I use green, this is our acid section. OK, and that's this bit here, the bit with the C double bond O on. That's the acid section. OK, so, the, yeah, the O in the middle. Think of it as a dividing line between the two carbon chains, okay? So ethyl ethanoate, this one, the aisle bit, that was the bit that came from the alcohol, which is easy to spot because there's no double bond though in it. The acid section, the ethanoate bit, okay? That comes from what was the acid, the bit where there is the, um, the C double bond though, okay? And that's kind of easy to remember because if you have... Um, a carboxylic acid and you neutralize it, say with sodium hydroxide, you end up with CH3, C double O minus, Na plus. That's your salt you get from it, okay? If you neutralize a, a ethanoic acid, that's called sodium ethanoate. So an ethanoate ion is literally the carboxylic acid ion, okay? The ethanoate ion. And that's what we've kind of got there, isn't it? Yeah. So the ethanoate bit always linked to the carboxylic acid. So just to put this theory to the test, ladies and gentlemen. What would you call this bad boy? 
And these are all H's, all right? I'm being lazy. But what would you call that bad boy? Remember, we're going aisle 08. What would you call that? Harvey saying methyl butanoate, Ruhab methyl butanoate. Any other advances on methyl butanoate? Going once, going twice, and you'd be absolutely right. Methyl butanoate. So after those, what, two minutes, ladies and gentlemen, thumbs up, thumbs down. How are we at naming carboxylic acids? Boom. That's what I like to see. Okay. So bear that in mind. Okay. Please bear that in mind. Um, and it's just knowing these techniques, isn't it? That's all it is. Nobody really tells you these things. It's like, yeah, we're doing esters today. This is how you make them. Uh, the kind of, uh, condensation reactions, acid, carboxylic acid, acid and alcohol. Yeah. Great. But you know, naming them and visualizing these things is so, so important. Okay. So, that's not the only way you can make esters, ladies and gentlemen. You can make them using uh, acyl chlorides. Anybody done acyl chlorides yet? Give me a yes or a no. Cheers, Ruha. Okay, so you've done acyl chlorides. Raseb's done them. Kashmir's done them. Harvey's done them. All right, cool. Okay, tough as hell. Nah, you say that. Okay, so let's have a look at, uh, and we have, we will get to proton NMR, I promise you. Um this is ethanoyl chloride. All right, this is ethanoyl chloride. If I reacted that with an alcohol, just like, ooh, what is that? That's nothing. That's something. Um, I'm using two carbons because I'm too lazy to draw anymore. So that's why we're working with lots of Fs tonight. Um, if they react together, okay, and one thing I will say actually. I misled you here. I just want to go back because this is an equilibrium, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So this is an equilibrium, which is why you need to use reflux in order to, you know, make sure you get a good and distillation to make sure you get a good yield of your ester. So I'm sorry about that. Just, yeah. Okay. That's a, that's a reversible reaction, that one. Okay. And I'll put that up there as well. This one, however, is not. This is a one-way ticket, okay? A one-way ticket. And Raseb, you're absolutely right. The big differences here is that this goes to completion, okay? But the problem is we don't get H2O as a consequence. We get HCl. It is also known as a condensation reaction. You get an ester. You'll get ethyl ethanoate out of this. Um, it's basically... A condensation reaction because the the definition of a condensation reaction is the elimination of a small molecule okay when these two organic uh, big organic molecules come together it doesn't have to be water so you can describe this as a condensation reaction just the same but of course this is not a nice byproduct to have all right so that's why this method isn't necessarily used all the time of course, we need a catalyst for esterification the normal way with a carboxylic acid. We don't need a catalyst here, okay? So, yeah, this is this is being recorded. This is going to sit on our page forevermore, uh, Phaser, okay? This is going to sit on our page forevermore. So you could do well, okay, by comparing and contrasting, making an ester using acyl chloride and alcohol and uh, carboxylic acid and alcohol. So you're going to get the same products, but there are differences between them, okay, in terms of what you get as a byproduct, whether it's an equilibria or a, go a completion reaction, whether you need a catalyst or whether you don't need a catalyst. So compare and contrast. And I think, you know, that and naming your esters and obviously knowing your, um, how can I put it, your physical properties of esters, really, okay, I think are really important. Um, but then you get into the world of hydrolysis, and that's 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 something else, okay? So, are we? Does that help somewhat with carboxylic acid, guys? I mean, I know there's there's a whole world surrounding them, as I showed you previously, but uh, hopefully that's uh, that's proved some help, okay? So, I'm going to do what I can to give you HNMR. I'm going to call this HNMR 101. 
Okay, I'm not going to call it the idiot's guide. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jara. <laughs> Can I do the mechanism for the formation of nitronium ions, your NO2, NO2 plus ions? Kashmir, what do you want me to do? Okay, I can go through electrophilic substitution, formation of nitronium ions, or I can go through HNMR because we're basically up for the hour, but I'm willing to do one. So what are we going to do? NMR, right, okay. So NMR 101, ladies and gentlemen. So we have... Let's have a molecule. Let's do propan one all nice and easy, okay? Because we are looking at the basic principles of this. And you know what? I will just want to lay this out for you and say, um, you know, these are the things you need to understand. And I think if you lay it out and separate it out into individual bits, then it does make more sense, okay? Because it can be quite overwhelming, this. There's a lot of stuff to take on board, okay? You hold your horses, Raseb, because you're wrong, okay? Just hold your horses. So let's have a look at our HNMR spectra. So this is what we call our chemical shift, okay? So the chemical shift, this is where we get our readout, if you like, for our HNMR. Um, the first thing we need to do is look at the peaks here, okay? And I tell you what, number one thing we should always get is the number of environments. Now, spotting environments is in itself a really important skill, okay? Thanks, Harvey, okay? Don't worry, I'm going to talk about that, Ruhab. I haven't forgotten, okay? Uh, yes, it is, Sundos. I apologize if you're at year one. This is A2 content. So HNMR, we need to spot environments. Now, what we're looking for is um, a unique place. Think of it this way. A unique place for a hydrogen atom to be. Now, what I'm going to say is that this one is probably the most obvious, OK, that one there has got a unique place. There's no other hydrogen atoms in that position next bonded to an oxygen anywhere else in the molecule. Correct. Now, where else? OK, is there a unique environment here for hydrogen, ion, uh, hydrogen atoms on the left, in the middle or on the right? Which one are you going to say left, middle or right? Thinking about left, middle or right. Think of it that way. At the beginning, yeah, on the left, absolutely. These hydrogen ions here exist, again, in their own little environment because there's no other CH3 on this molecule, is there? Okay, so there's no CA, other CH3 on this molecule. Now, um, let's have a look at these two. That's a CH2, right? Now, those hydrogens, okay, they exist in a different environment again because for a kickoff, it's a CH2, not a CH3. There's only two hydrogens bonded to that carbon, right? So are we all agreed that, that that environment for these two carbons here, in fact, I'm going to name these. Uh, this is environment A. This is environment B. So all those hydrogens in there have the same environment. And this is environment C. Now, what about these two? Are they in an environment on their own or are they the same as environment C? Because they're both CH2s, right? So you'd think they'd be the same. But are they the same or are they different? Okay, so Raseb's saying they've got an environment all on their own. Harvey's saying they're possibly C as well. I can see why you're saying that. Hajar is saying different as well. They are different, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and I'll explain why now. When we look at environments, we need to look at what else they are bonded to. We need to look at their neighbors, okay? So this CH2 here, this has got a CH2 on one side, and it's got a CH3 on the other. It lives in that place. It's got a CH2 neighbor to one side, a CH3 neighbor to another. So that's C. For D, it's got a CH2 on one side, and what's it got on the other? 
it's got an OH on the other. OK, so they've got different neighbors. They exist in different places within the molecule. So that's what you're always looking for is, OK, a CH3 and a CH3 are not always the same. It depends what they're bonded to. OK, um, uh, a CH2 is not always the same as another CH2. It depends where they sit in the molecule. OK, so just to give you another example, if I had um, this molecule here. And I add an OH there, an OH there. Just take 30 seconds, not even that. Yeah, it does like separate everything. How many different environments can you see in this molecule? This is 1,3-propane diol, okay? So 1,3-propane diol. How many environments can we see here? Everyone's saying one? Not the correct answer, folks. Harvey's got it. There are two. Okay. Because this H and this H, they exist in exactly the same place. Notice how the molecule's symmetrical. Okay. The molecule is symmetrical. Okay. Harriet's saying, no, Harriet, don't get rid of that. Don't redact that message. <laughs> so those two OHs are exactly the same. Okay. Agreed. Because they're both bonded to a CH2. These two, are also exactly the same because they've got an OH on one side and a CH2 on the other, okay? So what we have is we've got environment A. Both of these are environment B because, you know what, they've got exactly the same neighbors. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is environment C, existing all on its own in the middle there, okay? Because it's got CH2 either side of it. OK, so we have three environments here. So when you see sy symmetry in a molecule, you're going to get the same environments, if you know what I mean. OK, so most of the time you're going to get lots of different environments. But when you have a symmetrical molecule like this one, you're going to get fewer environments because, um, you know, the two different ends exist in the same place, if you like, relative to what they're bonded to. So it's three for that one. All right. But we're dealing with this one. So last up. So we've got four different environments here. So the number of environments equals four. I'll change back to black here. So on our readout on the NMR spectrum, we are going to get four um, peaks. Okay. So that equals four peaks. So if we have four environments, we have four peaks. Okay. Yeah, so the environments on the horizontal here, this is chemical shift. Where they lie on that scale, on that chemical shift in parts per million, you can tell from your data sheet what type of environment it is, whether it's a CH3, whether it's a CH2 next to an oxygen, whether it's um, a, 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 an OH, okay, or anything like that. So you can actually say, this is a HNMR. Nikita, we are not too far from finishing up, I'm afraid, but the whole thing will be kept on the uh, on the web on the YouTube channel. So we got four environments where they lie. Okay, I don't know off the top of my head. I haven't got a data sheet in front of me. Um, where they lie, I'm not paying attention to, but you can actually. We'll talk about that in a bit. But we're going to have four peaks. Now, what about um, peak heights? What does the peak height represent? So the number of peak represents the number of environments. The peak heights represent what, ladies and gentlemen? Not mass charge ratio. That's going, that's back to mass spec. This is going to be, this is different, Sarah. Okay. So abundance, pretty much. Yeah. So relative abundance, basically relative number of hydrogens in each environment. Okay. So the word relative is quite important there. So we've got four peaks, which is going to be the biggest peak, ladies and gentlemen, A, B, C, or D, which is going to have the, which is going to be the tallest peak here.
B. Absolutely it is, okay? So I'm going to do this for B. I'm going to do, uh, yeah, not quite, that for C. Okay, so what we've got here is, uh, this is B, I'm going to call that C, I'm going to call that D, and I'm going to call that one A. So what we've got here, okay, is, no, that's fine. If you haven't done it, I'm just giving you an intro. So the number of environments is the number of peaks. The peak heights of those peaks is basically dictated by the number of hydrogens you have in that peak. B contains three hydrogens. So this, these are relative peak heights of three to two to two to one. OK, so these are different peak heights because B has obviously got one, two, three hydrogens in it. That's got two. That's got two. And that's got one. Literally as simple as that. Is that OK with everyone? You can give me a yeah if you like. <laughs> there we go. OK, so. Yeah, there's more hydrogen in environment B. That's it. Literally, there's more hydrogen in environment B. OK, so it's a three to two to two to one in terms of the relative numbers of hydrogens in each environment. OK, um, so those are our peak heights. Now, um, something else we can tell. I'm going to put this over here. Um, three is that uh, the chemical shift. Uh, tells you. The type. Of environment. That is a case of use the data book. OK, so where it lies, the value here, where it lies, that is basically um, in your data book. So if it's got a chemical shift of 2.0, oh, look, it's a CH3 with bonded to a carbon chain. OK, so basically you have to look about you have to look that up. OK, and I don't know those values off the top of my head. I've put these anywhere randomly on this line for now. But be aware, the other thing that this can tell you is the type of environment it is. Is it a CH2? Is it a CH3? So on and so forth, okay? So there's four things this spectra, this HNMR spectra can tell you. The number of environments, the, the relative number of hydrogens in each environment, the chemical shift tells you the type of environment. And those of you that have done this, what's the fourth and final thing that I haven't shown on here yet, but it will tell you as well? Or what else happens to these peaks? Anybody know? No takers? Splitting. Now, this is the bit that confuses the, the behind off lots of people, okay? So splitting pattern equals the number of uh, hydrogens in neighboring environments plus one. I cannot stress that enough, the plus one bit. Okay. It's organic analysis A2, Nikita, yeah. So the splitting pattern. Now, let me just point something out to you. This environment here, B, okay? It's a CH3. We all know that. It's a CH3 environment. It's got three hydrogens in it itself. What's How many hydrogens are in its neighboring environment? So the environment directly next to it, how many hydrogens are there? Ajara says two. Harvey says two. You're absolutely right. There are two. We're looking at environment C, right? That's its neighbor. Now, I went, what's, what's two plus one? Not a trick question. This is the plus one bit. Thank you, Ruhab and Nikita and Harvey. Three. So what this environment B is going to have is a, a splitting pattern of three. And it will look something like this. Okay. The quick maths. Absolutely. This is known as a triplet. Okay, so we have got this peak here. 
where it is tells us the type of environment. The peak height or the peak area, um, that tells us the relative number of hydrogens in that environment. But the splitting pattern can actually tell us the number of hydrogens in the neighboring environment next to it, okay? So it's three bits of information about that environment and you get one bit of information about the neighbor. You with me? So the splitting pattern three here, this tells us that the neighboring environments have two um, hydrogens in it, okay? When we're looking at C, when we're looking at this one, yes, Luca, thank you very much. I was just getting to this. There are five hydrogens in its neighboring uh, environments, okay? We have got this one, this one, this one on the left-hand side. We've got this one and this one on the right-hand side. So this peak here for C, how many splits is it going to have? How many peaks is it going to have? If it's got five hydrogens in its neighboring environments, how many is that getting split into? Boom, six, absolutely. So we have got one, two. Ooh, no, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted at all. Undo. Um, oh, come on. That one. So one, two, three, four. And you'll always see them kind of arranged like that. That one's known as a multiplet. Okay, because if you get to quartet and anything after that, you just call a multiplet. All right, it doesn't matter, but it's split into six. Okay, hey, Anna. So what about environment D then, ladies and gentlemen? How many is that getting split into? Quick maths. Environment D, our peak for D, how many is that? Oh, you know what? Nine times out of 10, they don't ask you to draw it, Nikita, but you know what? They're not going to nail you down on how high to do those splits, okay? They're never going to look at that. Uh, we've got three, we've got six, we've got four. Don't worry, Ruhab. It's going to be three. Harvey, you've nailed it. Because D, okay, this one here, we've got, in its neighboring environment, we've got two hydrogens. The oxygen cuts the chain, okay? You cannot have, okay, the oxygen doesn't carry the splitting pan. We're only looking at carbons and hydrogens, okay? So if you've got an oxygen, like an OH, or a nitrogen, like an amine group or something like that, they're kind of out on their own. They're excommunicated. They're, they don't influence the others whatsoever, okay? So you need to have a carbon link. Think of it that way. So this one is actually only a triplet because of the two hydrogens on its left-hand side. The hydrogen in the alcohol group doesn't affect it whatsoever, okay? Bearing that in mind... What's the splitting pattern of A? Ruhab, I said I'd do it at the end and I'm trying to help everyone, mate. So if uh, you want to, I will do an explanation. If you can't make it, check back straight after you finish doing what you're doing and it will be here. Just skip to the end and read it, mate. Sorry about that. Hajara, you're absolutely right. It will be a singlet. This is just a singlet because there's no splitting because this, this oxygen stops any of that happening okay so that's what we've got there as a singlet okay so it only have one yeah absolutely so that's that's hnmr in a nutshell folks i've done that in 15 minutes okay so 15 minutes hnmr done ladies and gentlemen i think i think you've 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 kind of sapped as, as much information as you yeah thank you very much Okay, cheers. Thank you very much. All right, that's what we're here to do. Quality, yeah? So nice, neat little nuggets of information. That's what we're here to do. Now, um, Ruhab asked me to go over the competition. We have a competition going on at the moment, all right? Don't go anywhere, guys, because I've just got one little thing to remind you of. Um, yeah, don't worry, Nikita, just, just check back. You can watch the whole thing. It's, it's all recorded. So we have got a competition on the go at the moment, okay, guys? What we're looking to do, I mean, if you're not following us on social media, go and check us out. Find us, Taylor Tutors, on Facebook, on Twitter. I'm going to start using Twitter a lot more, so make sure you check that out. Uh, and, of course, Instagram as well. So make sure you follow us on there. You get to find out about all these live events coming up. You can even hit the bell on our YouTube channel as well, and you get a little notification when we've got a live starting and stuff like that. Um, so make sure you do that. Now, speaking of social media, if you want to win a TT subscription, 
um, for the entire year. Now, if you're already a subscriber, that means you won't have to pay anymore. If you're not a subscriber, you can win a subscription to any subject you want for the entire year. So all the way up to the end of June, 1st of July, basically, okay? Now, this is the way the competition works. What you need to do is get your friends, okay, to write a post, all right? Whether it's a tweet, whether it's a Facebook update, whether it's an Insta uh, post, okay, on any of those three social media platforms, okay? You need to get your friends to write a post saying that they nominate you for a TT subscription, okay? The only thing they have to do is mention your name, obviously, so we know who actually gets the, gets the prize, okay? But they need to use the hashtag tailored tutors. So hashtag tailored tutors, you need to get your friends to write a post saying, I nominate Dave for a chemistry, a free chemistry tailored tutors subscription, hashtag tailored tutors. And once they've done that, you're entered, okay? And we can find you with the hashtag tailored tutors. If they don't do that, we won't be able to find you. You can enter as many times as you like. So if you've got a bazillion friends, you can get all your friends to do it and you increase your chance of winning because we're going to pick one person at random from each individual um, uh, platform, okay? So that's what we're going to do there. Um, so yeah, you can enter as many times as you like on as many platforms as you like, but you've got to get your friends to uh, nominate you. You can't do it yourself, okay? So you need a, a, you know other accounts saying, I nominate Dave for a free TT chemistry subscription for the year, hashtag Taylor Tutors, and you're in the chance in, in the running uh, for a winner, okay? Do it anywhere on Facebook, we will find you, okay? So as long as you use that hashtag Taylor Tutors, we will find you on any of those three platforms, okay? And like I said, you can get 100 friends to do it for you. If you want, you just increase your chances of winning because every time they do that, it's an entry for you. So spread the word, okay? That's I, I put it on social media as well. So if you find us on social media, I've put a post on there explaining how the competition works. Um, you can do Instagram and Twitter and Facebook if you want, okay? So you can win a course for the year. There are going to be three winners, Okay, one from each platform. And what we're going to do is we're going to announce the winners next Monday live at six o'clock here on the YouTube channel. Okay, so set a reminder for that. If you've entered, you can find out. Uh, and yeah, just enter as many times as you like. So if you want to know more about the course, come and figure, come and check us out again on Monday at six o'clock where all three of us are here, are here my, me, myself, and uh, me, myself, me, myself, and I, um, me, Rich, and Ronnie. And uh, yeah, that's all right. Yeah, no worries, Ruhab. That's my pleasure. We're here to help. And like I said, we're not doing official kind of uh, lives this week in our individual courses. But you know what? I just thought I'd have a, have a drop in and uh, see how the whole uh, YouTube community is doing. So these are going to be pretty sporadic. I won't be doing it all the time. Um, but yeah, just as and when, I think just dropping in and helping, helping a few peeps out. I think that's uh, it's a good thing to do. Giving, giving a bit back. Yeah. So I'm going to go um and uh i will see you soon if you're not a subscriber come and check us out try the free trial um you know we'll we'll post have a look at the videos here on youtube and see what we're all about uh if you are a subscriber i will see you next wednesday uh for my uh for my live session all right thanks very much guys all right have a good evening see ya